Okay, thank you so much for joining us today for our third panel. This is about crowdfunding, which has become, I guess, a very, very sexy topic in the industry. Uh, when it came along about a couple of years ago is when it really hit the forefront. People thought it was going to be maybe like the Google Glass of the industry, you know, very sexy, lots of noise about it, but weren't, they weren't really sure about the practical value. In 2014, uh, the US market had a billion dollars of investment through crowdfunding. I believe it's projected to hit two and a half billion this year. So we've gathered a really, really fantastic panel of people in the space, as well as a developer slash investor in the space, to talk about it, talk about the model, and see how it's evolved and where it's going. So first up is Rodrigo Nino. He's the founder and CEO of Prodigy Network. Rodrigo is one of the pioneers in the crowdfunding space. He actually, uh, his company holds the record for the largest crowdfunding project in history with BD Bakata. Uh, th you raised over 200 million through the crowd for that project. And he's got AKA Wall Street, AKA United Nations, and 17 John Street. Rod Rodrigo, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, it's a pleasure to be here. To Rodrigo's right, we have Alan Shankar, whose company recently raised $30 million in a commitment to, uh, to fund his projects for $30 million from Ranger Capital. He is the founder and CEO of Share Estates, another crowdfunding company in the space. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for having me. On his right, Dan Miller, who is the president and founder of Fundrise, uh, again, another pioneer in the crowdfunding space. Uh, he, he comes from a development background, but they've done some incredible work. They've raised $31 million last year uh, from a group of investors, including the Chinese social networking giant Ren Ren, as well as uh, Marty Berger to his right, who is my next panelist. Marty Berger is the CEO of Silverstein Properties, one of the biggest developers in the United States and globally. Uh, Silverstein controls about 10 million square feet of prime commercial space in Manhattan and is also developing 30 Park Place. They've got a huge 2.2 billion, 2 .2 billion project in China, right, in the free zone and he is uh, a key investor in Fundrise. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. I wanted to start with, with the basics of crowdfunding. It came together, it was sort of seen as this democratizing investment in the space. Has that shifted recently as bigger checks have come in? Rodrigo? I, I don't think so. I think that what's really uh, is happening is that large institutional investors are contributing in a collaborative effort to enhance the participation of the crowd. Mm -hmm. If you have a large institutional investor, not on a corporate side, because quite frankly, we have decided not to take any VC money so far, as you know, but uh, on, a, on a deal basis, it is always good to have somebody to help you to uh, take down the buildings, mm -hmm. to potentially later crowdfund them down. And that is really, you know, the, the, um, that cross-pollination that we have seen between institutional capital and the crowd that is really helpful because traditionally um, institutional equity it doesn't stay for the long run. Mm -hmm. Normally, as you know, the, the exit on, on an institutional play is somewhere between three to seven years. Um, and there are many deals that are forced uh, on its exit based on that premise. Uh, and the crowd, you know, is more lined up with the long-term component of the real estate. So there is a perfect cooperation between the two. Um, so I think it's really, really exciting. Alan? I, I'm going to actually agree with Rodrigo on that. Even more recently with the, the recent commitment we got from the Ranger Direct Lending Fund, we're limiting those institutions and that institution specifically to fractionalized projects, with the idea being that we're not going to turn strictly to an institutional basis where we have one entity or one group funding a single project. The idea is to, at its core, bring together a crowd of people and that could be a combination of institutions and family offices along with individual investors. And you know, hopefully depending on where the Jobs Act and the securities regulations end up, we'll be able to bring the non-accredited investors back into the mix as well. Dan, you mentioned uh, just before the panel that you're raising about half a million dollars a day through your, pro through your platform. Uh, you said bigger checks. Is that really cha is that changing the mix of investors? Are the it's, mom and pops still getting a chance to get in on things? It's it's really been a mix. So you know, four years ago we we're raising a couple hundred thousand a deal. Last year about half a million. Now it's about three or four million a deal. So it is growing exponentially. It's just growing from a small base. And so I think what we've seen is larger investors be comfortable. And because of the rules and restrictions around crowdfunding, it's still very difficult to access retail. 
Um, but the sweet spot we've been in is below, deals below institutional scale, 30 million and below, urban infill transactions, where institutional players won't write the equity check because it's less than 10 million. So we found in those deals where we're funding two, three, five, seven million, we're getting better yields, we're get, getting better returns. So I definitely think there's certain pockets in the market that work best with crowdfunding, and over time it will move towards more core product, but right now we've found the niches that are, that are better for that product. Marty, you've got access to money from all over the world, institutional level capital. Why go this route? Well, we, we have not to date gone this route, but we, I personally am an investor in Fundrise. Um, I think crowdfunding is brilliant. You know, and when the stock exchange was first formed, it allowed individuals versus just corporations to own pieces of companies, and now individuals can own pieces of real estate, which is just fantastic. Um, I've known the Miller family for 30 years through mm -hmm. uh, Dan's father, Herb, and uh, when Ben and Dan came and showed us their platform, we just thought it was done really well, and we thought it had a lot of legs, and that's why we made, uh, both myself and our president of our company, Tal Carrot, made personal investments in the company. Three World Trade Center, I noticed something. There's an offering on the Fundrise website. Could you talk a little bit about what's going on with that? Yeah, uh, we ended up selling a portion of the senior loan that was structured for that deal. So it was over a billion dollar senior loan, and we sold increments in the $5 million position in that senior loan. Okay. So just, just for the record, we, you know, we raised $1.64 billion in bonds mm -hmm. uh, for that deal that we closed in November. And th I guess three million of that uh, was sold on the open market to Fundrise, and Fundrise was able to offer it to their investors. We'll be at 1.6 billion shortly. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Dan, my next question, as you sort of introduced me to the space two years ago, and you talked about the Jobs Act as being the great enabler and sort of brought this platform to the forefront. Uh, is there any pending political legislation that could you know, further the crowdfunding platform make it easier for people to invest or make it more cumbersome? So you know, when we started in 2010, it took us 18 months and about a half a million of legal to take a single deal and make it available to individual investors. So obviously that's not scalable, but we wanted to test the idea, why can't everybody invest in commercial real estate? Why isn't it something that everyone is a part of? There have been rules put in place starting in 2012 with the passage of the Jobs Act that were supposed to ease the rules around raising capital online. Unfortunately, most of the provisions that have been put into place only related to high net worth capital raising, accredited capital raising. So there are rules that have been passed in Congress that are sitting with the SEC that would greatly simplify and speed up the ability to access retail investors on real estate deals, you know, but it's kind of always two years away. It's been two years away for four years. So it's something long term that I think will have a huge impact in the industry, really opening it back up. Um, but to date, the SEC, I think, has been nervous to extend those rules and deal with policing for retail investors. Rodrigo, I'd, lo I'd love your take on that as well. I think that um, it's already underway. I think that we learned, you know, in 2007 that we weren't really protecting the crowd, you know, from anything, mm -hmm. really. You know, and the premise of low risk uh, in, re in, in exchange for a low return didn't really pencil. And I think that the crowd deserves, you know, individuals deserve the right to take on the risk to invest in the projects of their choosing. I think that we are in a world now where by the time the, uh, the, the report from your financial advisor comes in at 10 a.m., you have already browsed the, the, the market in Google, you know, and you know exactly what's going on, and you will be able to determine, for example, in our case, whether Manhattan, you know, is the best investment there is or not. So yeah, uh, I think that crowdfunding is a result of a profound trauma uh, caused by the status quo. Cool. So uh, um, I absolutely believe, you know, that um, the regulators will adjust to that and will enable this powerful, powerful tool uh, by giving uh, smaller investors access to the buildings that were privy to the large investors before. And when you say smaller, are you you're still talking about accredited investors or are you talking about unaccredited as well? No, I'm talking, I'm very interested, you know, in Title IV and in Title III for uh, non-accredited investors. Mm -hmm. Like you were saying before, the Vidi Bacata project, you know, was certainly not funded exclusively by accredited investors. I think that the, the, the SEC did the right thing by enabling it first to accredited investors just to test the waters. But I haven't seen, and correct me if I'm wrong, the first case of fraud, for example, out there, which is something, you know, that relates to transparency. So I believe, you know, that the market is ready now to, to, to go deeper, you know, down the, the, the pyramid of, of, from a socioeconomic standpoint and enable people, you know, to buy uh, a portion of the buildings, you know, like this one where we are at right now. 
Alan, you're doing something interesting with Reg A. You want to just talk about how that works and how it may provide opportunities to some a bigger pool of people? Yeah, so the first project that we actually launched with was a, a Regulation A project, which Fundrise has done some of as well. Um, and you know, it, it's a great exemption in the securities law because it allows non-accredited investors to get involved, but there's several problems with it when you're dealing with a real estate investment. Uh, one of the problems was the fact that there was a $5 million cap on what you could raise for any particular project, which the Jobs Act in Title IV is helping to alleviate with, you know, Regulation A+, raising the cap to, I believe, $50 million. But there's still an inherent problem with that, and it's the qualification time that it mm -hmm. takes to actually get the, pro the project approved and qualified by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, real estate is not one of those types of projects that lends itself to an ex extended uh, qualification period. You know, it's, you, you gotta, it's a fast moving market. You've gotta get the capital in, you've gotta get the deals closed. And to spend nine, 18 months, whatever it's gonna be, qualifying a deal before you could even raise capital for it makes it a little unwork unworkable. But hopefully with Regulation A plus, it'll be something that's feasible for larger one-off projects. Dan, you've got some war wounds from Reggae as well, right? How do you feel about it now? I mean, it's what we began. The idea, we were developing our own real estate. We wanted to allow individuals to buy in with us. And then we kind of went on this journey, thought that there must be a simple way to do this. And 18 months later, with a big legal bill, realized it was not so simple. But it's the, it's the way that the world is moving. Kickstarters raised over a billion dollars of donated capital. You know, there's going to be tens of billions, I would think, in investment capital if Kickstarter can do that. And socially and culturally, people want to be active in their communities. They want to be investing in places they're living. They want to be connected to it. So I think the undercurrent of the kind of millennial shift towards investing online, towards being connected to where you're living, will over time push the regulation. So I think we're in a short-term period where it's kind of blocked, but I think you're going to really see a sea change when it opens up in terms of what gets funded, not just real estate, local small business, agriculture, uh, or infrastructure, really all types of asset classes open up and allow individuals into them. Marty, do you think there's going to be a time when people will actually be able to digest, I can own a piece of this building? Not, not accredited investors with you know, big pocketbooks, but regular people who can invest in this just like any other asset class. Do you think there's a realization on the horizon? Well, what, what took us so, um, so pro by surprise about the platform was how much information was provided. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, if an individual wanted to go invest, you know, in a building today, it would be very difficult. If they invested in a fund that invested in a building, they'd have very little information. But the information that Fundrise and other uh, crowdfunding sources provide you uh, the access to, you know, you can really learn a, a lot about it and you can pick and choose what you want to do. So I do see, as that information continues to be more forthright, that uh, investors can really understand what they're investing in and, and benefit from it. Rodrigo, one of your favorite lines, and I'll repeat this, very innovative asset class, or very innovative platform, very boring assets. Do you think that's, that's going to change? Uh, there's a lot of residential brokers in the house. Do you think there's any, any scope for expansion of residential product through crowdfunding? When I say, when I say as, I, as I in fact do say, that it is a very boring asset class, mm -hmm. I mean it in the best of ways. I think it's the most predictable asset class there is. In 2007 and 2008, when we were in the middle of the worst crisis, large institutional investors picked commercial real estate in 10 top cities, out of which New York was their favorite one. And they didn't invest in multi-asset uh, uh, pools of, of, uh, of uh, funds, let's say. They didn't invest in multi-asset funds, excuse me. They did it on single, discrete, specific assets. And that was because though the prices dropped there only 2.5% when the median, in, from a national standpoint, dropped more than 10. So the, the interesting part, you know, is that the crowd didn't have access to it because a law that was invented in 1934. So that's why I say that when you look back and you open your eyes and you have access in 2013 to this incredible asset class, you see how predictable it can be. Anybody can go online and see what happened to New York real estate with its ups and downs, you know, but in the long run, there's nothing in my mind more predictable than this. That's why I say, you know, that it is a very boring asset class mm -hmm. with the innovation brought by technology. The only innovative part of the whole thing is essentially based on the way we are syndicating the equity from a retail basis online. But the rest, you know, has been there for 80 years. We just didn't have access to it. Done. 
Yeah, well, I think what he highlighted that, you know, crowdfunding is not innovation and sourcing deals and underwriting and closing deals. That's still very traditional. It's taking a deal, distributing it online, sending it to 20,000 people for free and having them invest and the transaction cost being very low. So the innovation really is in the distribution. And I think there are a lot of comparisons to the media and publishing industry that allowed very cheap distribution of content online and ultimately undercut large publications. I think you're going to see the same thing with crowdfunding, digital distribution of investments threaten the existing kind of asset management banking infrastructure over time. Marty, I wanted to ask you about your investment in Fundrise. Uh, do you think this is uh, people, other major developers are going to fall? I know you did this in a personal capacity, but do you think a lot of traditional commercial real estate developers are waking up to this possibility? Sure, it's being used all the time. Prodigy just uh, closed a transaction with it. And uh, again, from, from my personal perspective, I believed in the guys. I believed in the platform because they showed me every step of the way what happens. And it was an amazing uh, process that, you know, when you go through it on a regular real estate deal, is very tedious. And they had it all laid out, you know, internet-based. And it was really, uh, you know, uh, very accessible to anyone who wanted to invest in it. So I, I believe in the long term. Uh, right now, most of my deals are in the billion to two billion dollar range, so I'm not using Fundrise, but he's got about, what, three more years and he'll get there. The notice growth he, is there, right? No, notice he's not wearing a suit. Crowdfunding guys don't wear suits, right. but... Uh, um, the ratio of jeans <laughs> to suits has really gone up in this panel, so that's just the way. No, but we have great faith that, you know, look, it, it was hundreds of thousands two years ago. It was half a million last year, and it's millions this year. It's only a matter of time before it, it's tens of millions and hundreds of millions as the quality of his investor base continues to grow. Dan, $31 million raised uh, in the last round. I'm not sure where you at, are at overall, but how did that change the way you do business and the way you sort of have, how much say have you maintained in your company? Are you still? Sure. Um, the, the biggest shift was that it gave us a balance sheet to close deals with our own cash. So previously, you'd have a deal, we'd underwrite it, put it on the site, and you'd have to wait for the money to come in. If you're a good sponsor, a good developer, you need the money at closing, guaranteed, no other questions. So we raised that funding, which let us close the deal with our own balance sheet, and we take the risk of reselling it online. So to me, that's been the biggest shift and the reason why we need to raise capital. And we also went with the foreign investors. We think over time, opening up to foreign investors, allowing international investors to be part of this, really creating a global network for real estate deals and investment. Again, that's going to take a while. I think that is very powerful over time. Alan, uh, any, any possibility that you'll be pre-funding deals in the, in the coming months and years? So there, there's a, a big point to that is, going back to what I said previously, that real estate deals need to move quickly, that whether they're borrowers or people looking for equity investments, they need to, the peace of mind to know that the capital is going to be there when they get to the closing table. Um, one of the biggest hurdles was gaining traction and getting the funding you needed in a, in a timely fashion. You know, you can't wait a month to get funding. So well, the way we try to solve that is actually bringing in the institutions as anchors so that when we post a project, it goes up with potentially anywhere from 50 to 80 to 90% funding. Mm -hmm. And then our individual investors can come and invest side by side and in those projects as well. Uh, and it kind of preempts our need to take capital onto the balance sheet and loan it out that way. So that's not to say that I'm opposed to it. Both methods work and you know, we're always open to solving problems with different, uh, different solutions. But you know, that's, that's our particular solution. Rodrigo, there's, go ahead. We have it e easier for that matter because we're focused solely on institutional great assets, you know, and, and, and for the time being in New York. And, uh, and, uh, but I completely agree with the, with the panel because it is important to have a strong institutional partner to help you take down the projects and then crowdfund a portion uh, irrespective of what that is. Um, it in your case, it was the Corman on one project? No, we essentially, no, in the buildings we have bought so far, you know, we decided to do everything in-house. Mm -hmm. um, and we have obviously partners like uh, Corman uh, Communities, which is a great partner to have. They have been doing real estate for over 100 years. It's a four-generation uh, company, and they have a lot of experience. Um, but, but it is important to have institutional equity partners to come and buy the larger deals. These deals, you know, which were on our fifth deal here in New York, uh, uh, we have done in-house, if you wish, because we wanted to complete the full uh, circle before opening up to third-party uh, developers uh, uh, other than the Corman's. 
and uh, Metroloft for that matter. But eventually, um, we are going to have institutional equity lined up to buy buildings down for third parties to uh, execute on the construction end. By my last count, Dan, I think we have about 110 crowdfunders in the US at the moment. How do you separate yourself? It's, uh, the, ba the barrier to entry into the space is you put up a website and you have people come in. And how do you really make that? You've got, a, you've got a brand name investor behind you. You've got some money and a track record. But how else can you sort of separate so yourself? We were first by a few years. But it actually doesn't matter that much anymore. But we have to claim it. In 2010, we started. 2013, the next group came on. And by 2015, there's 80 to 100. So I mean, it's grown as fast as the industry. But the reality is our, our background was in real estate development. We had the real estate expertise in terms of deals and underwriting. Uh, we had securities attorneys who could figure out the legal framework, and then we had engineers who could put the technology together. So anybody can create a website, but integrating sourcing, underwriting of transactions with securities and legal frameworks, because this is all very new, um, with high quality software, that's very difficult. So there are a lot of groups being created, but who has real vol volume, who has real expertise, who really is growing, it's a much more limited set. And I think, obviously, real estate is very cyclical. At some point, there's going to be a reckoning with deals you know, potentially defaulting, and that's when platforms are going to prove themselves. So our views were structured for that. We have the balance sheet for that. We're built for that. And out of the next downturn, I think there'll be consolidation with a few firms really leading. Rodrigo, you've also been in the space for a while. But if I were to start today, is it too crowded? Should I just give up and go home? I, have a, I, have a, I need to give you two answers to that question. The first one is that go ahead and do it. Because I believe that this is not the creation of a new business. This is the creation of a whole new industry. And I have to say that if you believe you have an, an angle and you have access to a certain asset and you say you know, that uh, the crowd should have the right to participate in that specific asset that ties back to who you are and why you're an expert in that specific field, you, know, you should do it. I think that people are con getting concerned with the number of companies. I think that we don't have enough. I think that you know anybody with an angle should jump in and try to do crowdfunding because there's no such a thing as competition, you know, when you're creating a whole new industry. We are, you know, we share a bunch of panels, you know, with the Millers and with uh, 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 other friends, you know, doing crowdfunding. And I, quite frankly, don't think they are competition or that I pose any sort of competition to them. So there's there's room for everybody. Having said that. It is very important for the people to understand that while everybody's talking about crowdfunding and real estate now, they need to always look at the underlying asset. You know, I have seen plenty of examples of crowdfunding platforms raising equity for single family home loans at 14% interest. If somebody is asking for $400,000, mm -hmm. you know, at $10,000 a pop, paying 14%, I need to tell you that there is something wrong off the bat. So it's all about the underlying asset, you know? It's all about the underlying asset. Technology eventually, like everything else, is going to be highly commoditized. Marty, I just wanted to step away from crowdfunding for a second and talk about real estate technology as a whole. There's been about $850 million invested since 2012 in real estate tech startups. And I'm talking about in the US. And uh, we looked at the UK, the US, and a couple other countries. But how do you see that space evolving? Are you planning to sort of actively follow it and actively invest in real estate technology? Um, well, we, we're really trying to invest in new ways of raising money. Because our deals are so large, it's not easy to just go to you know, the, the money center banks and say, hey, we need a $2 billion loan, because you need like 12 of them to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so we're breaking up those loans and using EB-5s, which is uh, employment-based uh, immigration uh, investments in the US. We just finished our first $250 million raise for our Four Seasons Hotel downtown New York, uh, which will be the takeout for the person who, the, there was an, a sovereign wealth fund that bought the hotel from us. We're actually, actually the lender to them. We raised $250 million, mostly from China, but from a lot of other countries as well. Uh, we had 500 investors that each invested $500,000. And we plan on using that vehicle again for two other large developments we're doing. Um, and then you have to find other innovative ways to, to, raise, to raise both equity and debt. Um, you've seen a lot of uh, news about the Israeli bond market, uh, where Gary Barnett, Related, and others are, are raising, you know, three and a half to four and a half percent cheap equity, uh, and they can 
take down two to three hundred million dollars at a time and they have follow-ons. So there's a lot of new innovative ways uh, that are mostly outside of this country that to, to raise that money. Okay. Dan, besides the ability to wear comfortable shoes and jeans, what, what do you think about in terms of how good is it to be in the real estate tech space right now? I, uh, so, you know, my background is in real estate development. That's really where my passion is. And the fact that we have a platform that lets us interact with developers all over the country, mm -hmm. put together these deals. A lot of them are interesting development deals where there's a narrative, there's a story, there's something exciting about it. So for me, it's, it's really the transaction, the development side that's interesting and layering the technology in with all of that. Um, but, but it is nice to be doing something creative in real estate. Normally, it's not an industry where you can, you know, have something creative and drive it forward and, and lead. So I'm definitely enjoying it, but it, it's going to be a long haul. I think kind of the waves and the cycles and the, the broader crowdfunding security changes are going to play out over a long time. Alan, you come from a legal and title insurance background. What's the space like in comparison? So that's actually one of the reasons we got started in this space is my partners have been in the title insurance world for about 15 years. And from a business development standpoint, they were connecting their clients with each other long before you know, crowdfunding was a word, mm -hmm. um, or a buzz for that matter. But they, you know, sometimes they had clients who sold assets and had capital to place, and other clients that were doing development projects and needed access to funding. So they were connecting them, but we weren't really monetizing the process at that point. So when you know, crowdfunding became a thing and it really started to catch on, it was sort of the next evolutionary step for us. And it was something that we were already doing that we had plenty of experience with, but we were able to make it more efficient and more cost effective by building the technology into it. And you know, we, we kind of started blind on it. You know, we went out, we started building our software. It was a, it was a process because we had to figure out, okay, what features and tools do we need? What do our investors want to see? What do our sponsors want to see? And we're always adding to it. And it's its, its own living, breathing machine that's going to continuously be expanded and built upon, and it's, at the end of the day, we're you know, a financial tech company, so there's always going to be room for growth in both ends of the business. Rodrigo, do you think there's a, this is going to impact, crowdfunding is going to impact the kind of assets that are developed? Because at this point, the institutional capital is helping you a large portion of the way, so I'm, I'm assuming they're going for the same type of asset that they would. Are, they, are you going to see any revolutionary development in terms of product? Yes, and actually, and, and, and that's interesting about our experience because we didn't start it here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. As you know, I'm originally from Colombia. I've been living here over 18 years now in the States. But over there, crowdfunding started in a very different, different way. It started financing ground-up projects that didn't have access to traditional institutional equity. So like the BD Bacata project is not only the world record in crowdfunding, but it is also all cash no senior financing. Mm -hmm. Picture a 66-story skyscraper worth over $300 million funded all cash. That is something that by definition you cannot fund through traditional equity. You cannot put a senior at 9% in pesos and a junior at 14% and then put up $80 million behind it. Um, so with crowdfunding, you could line up the, the equity with the long-term component of the real estate because the crowd was willing to take a chance that the institutional equity didn't want to. Um, the thing is that in this cycle right now, getting equity, uh, getting senior financing, you're not LIBOR plus two, for example, like we're getting on our deals, uh, it just makes more sense to take a piece, you know, through senior equity uh, uh, financing, I mean. But eventually, this will be an incredible tool for those deals, you know, that would be difficult to finance yet still being very, very good. Dan, can you talk a little bit about your due diligence process? Because uh, a lot of hedge funds are being attracted to the space. By definition, they're looking for, you know, they're okay with risk a little bit more than, than traditional, uh, you know, investment firms. So isn't that going to affect what you do as well? Yeah, I mean, the, the underwriting sourcing diligence process, it's, it's similar to what a private equity firm does. You know, the deal comes in, we put together an initial report, once the report signed off and there's a committee, we issue a term sheet, term sheet signed, we then put underwriting memos and take the initial due diligence info. We have a sweet spot, you know, deals 30 million and below in core metro top 25 markets, oftentimes in the emerging areas of those cities. We're normally fitting in as preferred equity, so bank loan goes up to 65%. We'll go from 65 to 85% low to mid-teens return. So we have a product, we have a specific part of the market we like to be in, we have specific neighborhoods and deals and areas we like to be in. So when it comes through, we have a box, but the process of underwriting, closing, legal, diligence review, 
is all there and, and the reason why we've been having institutional investors comfortable investing with us is they can log in and see all the information like Marty was saying before. It's all there, our underwriting memo, all the diligence docs. We're not hiding from anything and over time when people see deals happening and they see that all the information is there, they're able to look at it, do their own homework, they start to get comfortable. So I think the consumer behavior patterns with e-commerce that took a while for people to get comfortable putting their credit card information online, understanding when the box was going to arrive, now it's instant on their phone, same day delivery. I think it's similar with crowdfund investment. It seems very new, people take some time to get comfortable with it, but as they start investing, they see the process, they see the data, and I think within five or ten years it will be a, a very normal thing to do. And again, that's what we were so impressed by was the backbone of what they've got. You said, hey, can anyone just turn on an internet, a website and start a, a crowdfunding site. And the amount of backup data and technology that's behind these, these funds is incredible. I mean, to, to close a $5 million deal is the same as closing a $100 million deal. The amount of paperwork, the amount of due diligence uh, from environmental reports to physical re reports to legal reports and title, it's all there for you to, you know, to put out there. And, and these guys just uh, organize it in a way that's very, uh, you know, very easy to understand. Alan, I'd be interested in your answer as well to the due diligence and how you go about selecting an asset. Yeah, the, the due diligence factor is, is several fold. Uh, when an investor comes to our platform or to any platform for that matter, they should be looking not only at the asset and how that project is vetted, but they should be looking at the project sponsor, the platform itself, and the team that's behind the platform. Because uh, they're all going to be directly uh, affecting how your asset performs and what type of reporting you get. and. Uh, continuing you know, education you receive. And we take a multi-tier approach to that, and when we're looking at a project, we you know, look into dozens of factors. I think we, we look at 32 different variables from the leverage of the property, that is the loan-to-value ratio, to the sponsor's experience in terms of you know, how many millions of dollars or billions of dollars worth of transactions have they been involved in. Um, we'll look at their experience in terms of have they been part of the particular market that the project is located in? Have they worked on this type of uh, property? Is it a, a multifamily property, retail, et cetera? And then we'll also look into the development phase of the project. So we've had people come to us who have been doing their first ground up construction project and they're traditionally a rehabber. And you know, if they've done mostly fix and flip projects, we're not going to approve their first ground up construction project with us. So I think you got to look at it from multiple perspectives outside of just the asset, but also the sponsor, and then also the platform and the team that's behind that platform. If you think about it, you know, uh, um, the best way to approach it is to go back to, to, to the uh, very boring asset class. Uh, uh, we just do what has been done for the past 80 years. It is highly, highly commoditized. Uh, and we just do what big institutional investors have done for 80 years. We just follow a strict institutional criteria. Whatever uh, a family like the Corman would buy, or somebody like Marty would buy, we would like to buy as well. Because if you analyze it, if it is all about access, why not providing access to the assets that the guys who know better for 80 years uh, uh, have bought you know, consistently? So. And that's a very important point because crowdfunding is, it is not just a source of cheap equity for projects that guys like Silverstein wouldn't touch. Mm -hmm. You know, why would you be willing to bring a crowd to a project you know that doesn't follow a strict institutional criteria? Okay. I wanted to ask you about foreign investment as well. Uh, foreign investment, we've had a panel about that. Marty, you mentioned EB5 as well. How easy is it for a foreigner to invest in real estate crowdfunding in the U.S.? Uh, or if it's not, are there, you know, is there hope on the horizon for them? Um, I think it hasn't, I, 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 let me put it differently. I wouldn't, I, I, it's impossible for me to think of an easier way or a better moment for an international investor to come in this market. Sure. You know, you see it everywhere. From a residential standpoint, you know, the numbers are through the roof and, uh, and uh, they appear to be staying, you know, uh, on the growth uh, side of the equation and when it relates to crowdfunding it is also amazing because uh, you have a smaller investor able to participate in one of these buildings for as little as fifty thousand dollars internationally mm -hmm. and they can buy it online you know obviously the due diligence and the KYC and the AML for internationals is a little bit harsher if you wish 
for money laundering issues, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So that's why you work with third party professional fund administrators, but thanks to technology, you can do that very efficiently. Mm -hmm. At this very moment, you know, we have just raised, and I think we're the first company to have uh, reached the benchmark of the $100 million in common equity. And uh, just in common equity, not in the, not in the, in the, um, total of the projects, you know, just common equity in crowdfunding from uh, 22 different countries and 17 different states. So that gives you an idea of uh, how viable it is now for smaller investors to participate, you know, in this incredible, very boring, you know, asset class. Dan? Yeah, that, that's so by the end of June, we'll have uh, China, Israel, UK and Australia available for foreign investments. I really think, I mean, think about the amount of middlemen you're cutting out for an individual in a foreign country to go direct into a transaction in New York. I mean, normally at least two or three people would be in the middle marking up fees, taking asset management and upside. So I think it's going to take time. You're going to have to have distribution partners or partners in those markets that make people comfortable. But the idea of creating that tech efficiency and bringing real estate investment global, I mean, Marty mentioned Israel, you're having huge bond offerings and huge equity offerings there. If you could make that direct and kind of allow those similar investors in smaller scale into these platforms, I think it will be, um, it'll bring a lot of the capital to this space over time. But it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a while. I think it's going to develop over time. Marty, this understanding of New York City as a very safe, very sort of stable asset, does that extend to pretty much every country that you operate in? Uh, in our experience, you know, we're selling condos now down at the Four Seasons uh, Luxury Residence downtown at 30 Park Place. And about 35% of our buyers out of the 112 units we've sold so far have been international. And they've come from all over, Russia, Israel, China, uh, Switzerland, Canada, South America. So they're really coming from all over the place. Um, and we continue to see this in every asset class. Uh, we have institutional partners from Israel. We have institutional partners from China. We have institutional partners from the Middle East. Uh, so it's really coming uh, you know, in droves. And I think the China side is just the tip of the iceberg. It's just starting. You're hearing names like Anbang and Oceanwide, and these names you never heard of six months ago, mm -hmm. yet they're billion, buying billion-dollar assets. So what's going to come behind them are going to be more of the retail investors who are going to look to the crowdfunding and other ways to invest. Right. They're buying some of the icons of the New York skyline, right? The Waldorf Astoria, amazing hotel. I wanted to open up to questions because we have ab about five minutes. So, Stuart, so <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. No, we, I can't, we, we can hear you, I'm sorry. I think someone will get you a mic, hopefully. I'll get you a mic. <laughs> Thank you. My name's David Block from Black Capital. We do private equity as well as lending. And my question is, does the crowdfunding platform work for lenders? who are looking to put together funds to lend out? We've seen blindfold funds to be the least attractive thing. All our deals are individual assets that we're selling that's tangible that, that the investor can underwrite and connect with. So different platforms may do different things, but I think blind pool funds in general, you know, saying I want to raise 50 million to then lend out, historically have not been successful through crowdfunding. So um, what is your responsibility if a deal goes bust? Do you have a fiduciary responsibility to investors uh, in a down cycle, which uh, none of the platforms has seen yet? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, and I think it's twofold. And I would like you know, Dan to also answer it, because our models are different. At this moment, we are crowdfunding on a JB capacity uh, for our own deals. Eventually, as I said before, we're opening up to third-party operators and, in, and, and uh, developers, but for now, we are JB equity with the investors. So yes, we do have a fiduciary duty relative to them, and we treat them as our limited partners. So it, do, it isn't different than the typical relationship that you would have with an investor. Either you, for example, you know, which I'm sure it's the, the follow-up question, what happens when there's an additional capital call? 
If that happens, the only way you know, to deal with that, if you don't want to go back to the crowd and get the additional equity, is to have strong sponsorship and strong ownership. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the best question. The reality is until these platforms have gone through a downturn, there's a lot of skepticism about it. Real estate cyclical, there will be distress, and, and are these platforms built to work through that? So we create an entity that makes each investments, and the investors buy a derivative note tied to the performance of that deal. So we're the counterpart to the sponsor. We can restructure the deal. We can negotiate. We have rights in our agreements in terms of completion guarantees, in terms of ability to force an exit or take over the property. We have recognition from the lender in terms of the ability to cure if there's a default to take over the senior loan. So we've built it as if we're going to have to take over 10, 20 percent of the assets. We're going to have to write checks to extend the deals to work out. And we have our balance sheet and co-investment partners built for that. So we're expecting that it's going to happen. I don't, it's not a particular deal. It's just the nature of real estate. And I think from that, a few platforms will show that they have resilience, that they had good underwriting, that they understood how to structure the deals. And I think out of that will come a lot of growth from the industry. So pick your crowdfunding sponsor carefully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Platform. So my question was, what level of involvement do investors typically have? Do you ever see the success of a deal even more so because of the investors getting involved? Um, I, I love, thank you. <laughs> I love that question, you know. We just, we delivered a hotel in Bogota, another one of our projects, where we raised the equity for it with uh, 1,250 investors. And it normally takes in Bogota about two years to ramp up a hotel because it's just a business-driven city. So there is no one on the weekends, you know, for, from a hospitality standpoint. But our hotel was ramped up in, le ramped up in less than uh, six months because of the participation, the active participation of the investors in the crowd. If you think about it, hospitality is a business driven by loyalty. And it don't, I, I can't think of a better program, you know, uh, a reward program than ownership. So it really, the revolution goes way beyond just splitting the pie with the smaller investors. And I think you see differences from different projects and different investors. We have groups of investors that are entirely passive. Um, we also take a step further, which is to basically separate our investors from the sponsors. Uh, a lot of the time when our sponsors are coming to us, they, they're coming to us to solve a financing need for them they want to focus on what they do best, which is to find and acquire attractive real estate opportunities. So they turn to us to do the financing for them, and we're, in a sense, their medium. We're dealing with the investors, we're handling reporting, and et cetera. And some of our investors are active in the sense that they're always calling us, they're asking questions, they want status updates. And in other cases, we're dealing with development projects where sometimes they have a connection with uh, somebody who does masonry work or somebody who deals with uh, a, a window salesman and they can actually throw those cards into the ring and potentially lower costs for our developers, etc. Um, so you really see it all over the place. It just depends on the particular investor that's getting involved. Thank you so much for coming here and thank you all for being here as well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.